Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, another video for the November 22, paper 4-1. Coming to question number 7a, in some varieties of domestic cats, the gene for fur color is located on the X chromosome. This gene has two alleles. One allele codes for black fur and the other allele codes for ginger fur. The two alleles are co-dominant. So a heterozygous cat will have fur with patches of black and ginger colors. A cat with fur of two colors is known as a tortoise shell. Using appropriate symbols, construct a genetic diagram to show the results of a cross between a female tort tortoise shell cat and a male ginger cat. Now they've told you this, that this is the gene for fur color is located on the X chromosome. This is a sex linked genetic question. So symbols you have to decide then parental phenotype is tortoise shell female and ginger male and then you have to do the parent genotype the gametes the offspring genotype and the offspring phenotype and this is all for five marks and very easy for you to get five out of five in this now you know that in the co-dominant phenomena you have to take capital letters you don't have to give a capital letter small so let's take x raised to the power b for black fur and x raised to the power g for ginger fur. Now the tortoise is female. Now the first thing you've got to understand is both has got to be xx and the male has got to be xy. Unless of course it specifies in the question that it is now of course different. Some, some uh, animals the male is xx and the female is in fact xy. So that is a possibility as well. So now because it's uh, tortoise. So it has to be XB and XG and the ginger male has to be XG and there's nothing on the Y chromosome because remember this that sex linked disorders are on the part of the X chromosome where there is no corresponding part of the Y chromosome. So this is the X chromosome and this is the Y chromosome. So all these are present here and that's why they're called sex linked disorders. So this would be XGY. So now completing the parent phenotype because the phenotype was given tortoise female and ginger male. So the parent uh, genotype, so this would be here, this one, I've given it here X, B, X, G, Y, tortoise was co-dominant and ginger male would be X, Y, but then J, G would be present on the X chromosome and Y would not have anything on it. Then uh, gametes, you just separate them and write them separately. So you got one mark for that. Then uh, offspring genotypes would be XB, XG, this would be the one, then XBY, then XG, XG, and then XGY. And the XB, XG would be tortoise, the XBY would be black male, and the ginger female, and then the ginger male. So I'm sure this was not a very difficult genetics question, and everybody could have got the 5 out of 5. Okay, then we go on to the next part of the question. Um, in humans, the TYR gene is involved in the production of a dark pigment melanin in some cells. Describe how the expression of the TYR gene leads to the production of melanin. Direct question, not very difficult. TYR codes for tyrosinase, converts tyrosine into dopa, converts dopa into dopaquinone, and dopaquinone converted to melanin. So wording it correctly, TYR codes for tyrosinase, converts tyrosine into dopa, dopa to dopaquinone, and dopaquinone converted to melanin. Of course, you must remember this. This is something factual, which we've done in the class so many times. Now coming to question number eight, figure 8.1 is a diagram of a kidney nephron. You can see the Bowman's capsule A, B, C. Now with reference to figure 8.1, name A, B, and C. Now what is A? A is the distal convoluted tubule. B is the cortex and C is the loop of Henle. So you have to just name them. So name means just give the name for distal convoluted tubule, cortex, loop of Henle, and you got your three out of three. B part of the question, antidiuretic hormone ADH is involved in the maintenance of the water potential of the blood. Figure 8.2 shows the relationship between blood ADH concentration, urine concentration, and the flow rate of urine. The flow rate of urine is the rate of production of urine by the kidneys. So we've got again, this is a very famous graph. They keep on giving you to this because both sides are labeled. This is the urine flow rate on this side, cm cube per minute, and the urine concentration in millimoles per dm cube on this side. Now this is typically to confuse you so that you can then 
make a wrong answer to it. And uh, what do we have on the x-axis is blood ADH concentration in arbitrary units. So urine concentration and urine flow rate. So this is the urine concentration is this one. And the urine flow rate is this one. Right, so now we've got this graph. Now let's see what the questions they want to ask us from the graph. It's on the next page. Describe the relationship shown in figure 8.2. So as I told you many times, describe is no biology and everybody should get their three marks in this. This is a very easy part of the uh, paper. So let's do the describe now. So I can probably try to get the whole of it here. So describe the relationship. Now, when you look at the describe, ADH, uh, con as ADH concentration increases, as ADH concentration increases, now this is how, how it's increasing. As ADH concentration increases, what is increasing? The urine concentration increases. So the urine concentration is this in green. So the urine concentration is also increasing. Where is the urine concentration? It's on this side. So the urine concentration is increasing from what? From somewhere here, 200 to somewhere here, nearly less than 1,200. So where do you read this off? You've got to realize urine concentrations in millimoles. Now, as ADH concentration increases, urine flow rate decreases. So urine flow rate is this one, which I have colored in red. So you can see the urine flow rate is decreasing. And that is in centimeter cube per minute. As urine flow rate decreases, urine concentration increases. As urine flow rate decreases, you can see this decreasing the urine concentration is increasing. So you got your three marks. And then you did a data quote with the units. And I'll just do one of it and so that you can see how do you do a data quote. So as ADH concentration increases, urine concentration increases. As ADH concentration increases, urine flow rate decreases. As urine flow rate decreases, urine concentration increases. So you're doing a comparison between the relationships. So describe the relationship. And the data code means that you give me figures like 10 arbitrary units is 200 millimoles per dm cube. At 90 arbitrary units, it's 1185 millimoles per dm cube. You could do either this or you could do it for the urine flow rate and then you would give me the units according to that. Coming uh, to the C part of the question, describe and explain the action of ADH on the cells of the collecting duct when the water potential of the blood decreases. Now what happens? ADH binds to cell surface membrane receptors on the collecting duct cells. And G protein is activated. Second messenger CAMP is formed. Protein kinase is activated. Vesicles move towards the cell membrane and these are called aquaporins and these attach to the cell membrane of the collecting duct which makes it more permeable to water. And so more water leaves the urine and enters the blood. So ADH binds to cell surface receptors on the collecting duct. And this is, of course, because the G protein activated, CAMP formed, protein kinase activated, vesicles move and fuse with the cell membrane of the collecting duct, and which contains the vesicles uh, are containing the aquaporins and makes the membrane more permeable to water. More water leaves the urine and enters the blood. Now, you see, you've got five marks for this. Now, the IV, you've got something like eight mark scheme points. So any five of these, and you would got have, uh, so I'm not saying you have to write all of these eight to get the five marks. So you can easily just memorize this and uh, then remember it because it's a very direct question and the ADH keeps on coming again and again in your papers. Now coming to question number nine, a neuromuscular junction allows the transmission of an action potential from a motor neuron to a striated muscle fiber causing it to contract. Figure 9.1 is a graph of an action potential in a motor neuron. 
you can see the time in milliseconds and the membrane potential on this side is in millivolts. Figure 9.2 is a graph of an action potential in a striated muscle fiber. So this is the graph of an action potential in a striated muscle fiber and this is the action potential in a motor neuron. Now they both figure 9.1 and figure 9.2. Now it says with reference to figure 9.1 and 9.2. Describe the difference between the action potential in a motor neuron and the action potential in a striated. Now this is one of those very easy questions which everybody should get right. Because describe is actually no biology and you just have to give me a comparison. This is for 4 marks. So everybody must get 4 out of 4 in this. And you just compare these two graphs. You compare this with this. So it's a very good way to compare it. It's a very simple way. Now always remember in such a question when you're talking of it you talk of the first one before so if you're talking of difference between the look at the question and if you're talking of uh, uh, the read the question it says action potential motor neuron and action potential of striated muscle so you must talk about this first because this has come in the beginning of the question so in a motor neuron or you give the heading in a motor neuron if you're going to talk about the other one then you give the heading now in a motor neuron and then you continue with this now what is going to happen if you look at it in a motor neuron just look at it here the resting potential is higher it's minus 70 millivolts here while here it is minus 90 millivolts so minus 70 as opposed to minus 90 millivolts then uh, this got you two marks, resting potential higher, motor neuron resting potential higher. Then if you gave me the figures, minus 70, minus 90, got you another mark. Then smaller change in membrane potential. What does this mean? This was minus 70 to plus 40 means 110 millivolts. While in this it was 90 to plus 40 is 130 millivolts. So smaller change in the membrane potential of the motor neuron because it was only 110 millivolts or if you said 110 millivolts versus 130 millivolts well that got you another mark then depolarization text takes less time in the motor neurons you see it took exactly one millisecond but here it took two milliseconds you see that this depolarization starts here at two milliseconds here it starts at one millisecond so depolarization takes less time, is faster, uh, takes less time in this. You can also see that it, this took one millisecond here. It takes two milliseconds from two to four. Then action potential is uh, 2.7 milliseconds versus four milliseconds. So this is how much? Let's look at it. Two to six. So this is 4 milliseconds, while here it is, this is the striated muscle, while here it is 2.7, up to here, so it's 2.7 here. Then in this situation there is a hyperpolarization and here there is no hyperpolarization. So the comparisons are very clear. There were seven comparisons and you have to give me any four of the comparison. This is one question where you can get full marks. Whenever answering this question, whenever is a comparison, you must give the heading motor neuron or whatever is in the question. So resting potential is higher in the motor neuron as compared to the muscle and it's minus 70 millivolt versus the minus 90 millivolts. Then there's smaller depolarization and which is 110 millivolts in the motor versus 130 millivolts in the muscle. Then depolarization takes less time, 22.7 millisecond motor versus 4 millisecond in the muscle. And hyperpolarization occurs in the motor and not in the muscle. So lots of points for you to give your 4 out of 4 and get your 4 out of 4, which was uh, easy to describe. I don't think it was a very difficult describe and you must learn this habit of doing this describe. Then coming to the B part of the question, there are three phases in the contraction of a striated muscle. Latent phase, contraction phase and relaxation phase. So latent phase, contraction phase and relaxation phase. The tension in a muscle represents the degree of contraction of its fibers. 
Figure 9.3 is a graph of the tension in a striated muscle during the three phases of contraction. Tension in the muscle, there's no unit on the y-axis, but stimulation time in milliseconds, up to 100 milliseconds. Figure 8.3, figure 9.3, with reference to figure 9.3, explain what is happening in the striated muscle fiber during the latent phase. During the latent phase, what is happening during the latent phase? Well, the, any, uh, you could have given me as a three mark question. So the T tubules are depolarized. The calcium diffuses out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium binds to troponin. Tropomycin moves or exposes the binding sites. And you see for the myosin or actropomycin moves and then for the myosin on the actin cross bridges form or you can say the myosin head binds to the actin. So there were six points for this, and this is all very, very, you know, you have to know the syllabus. This is not something which you have to conjecture or, uh, you know, just plan and read and then think of it, but it is just actual material which you need to uh, give it back on the paper. So T tubules depolarized, uh, CO2 plus diffuses out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, CO2 plus calcium, uh, Ions bind to troponin, tropomycin moves from the binding sites for the myosin, which attaches onto the actin, uh, more myosin on actin, and then cross bridges form. Or you can say myosin head binds to the actin. So cross bridges means myosin head binds to the actin. Now these wordings are very, very, very exact, and you cannot sort of come up with something new. It has to be these exact wordings, which means that you need to do a lot of rote learning. Now coming to the part Three, suggest why the relaxation of phase shows a gradual decrease in muscle tension. Now, why does it show a gradual decrease in muscle tension is because cross bridges break and the myosin head detaches at different times. So that is why there is a slower or a gradual decrease in the muscle tension. So cross bridges break and myosin head is detached at different times. So that was a little difficult to suggest. I would ask you to, you know, really forget the suggest and uh, can do the rest of the paper instead of concentrating on the suggest and wasting five to 10 minutes on that. Next question, question number 10. The passage below outlines homeostasis. Complete the passage by using the most appropriate scientific terms. Homeostasis in mammals is a process of keeping the dash environment, the internal environment of the body in optimum condition so that cells can function efficiently. Blood water potential, core temperature and blood glucose concentrations are all factors that need to be kept at optimum values or set point. When a condition deviates from a set point, a corrective mechanism is triggered. An increase in blood glucose concentration triggers processes to decrease it and vice versa. This corrective mechanism is called negative feedback. That wasn't very difficult. And then, of course, it goes on. The pancreas is involved in the control of blood glucose concentration. Glucose binds to receptors. Glucose binds to receptors on the cell surface membrane or pancreatic cells. These are endocrine, or you can say the islets of Langerhans. and these are endocrine cells or islets of Langerhans or alpha and beta was also allowed, which secrete hormones such as insulin and glucagon. The two hormones have opposite effects on the blood glucose concentration. For example, the action of one hormone stimulates the uptake of glucose by cells for respiration and the action of the other hormone stimulates the breakdown of glycogen to glucose in the liver. And this was a total five marks. And that completes this paper. And this is going to be another paper four done so that you all can revise this paper and see how well you can score. Um, it's a lot of learning. Please revise those chapters which you are unable to do and then come back to the next papers. I will be posting more papers in these uh, next coming weeks.